Hey guys, welcome to part 1 of the Rook Endgame series with the pawn on the 4th rank. Now in this video we will be looking at a few positions where the defensive side's king is cut off by a file from the pawn and this is theoretically a draw but the process can be rather complicated. Now theoretically with the pawn on the 4th rank, white wins if the defensive side's king is cut off by 2 or more files from the pawn. This theory applies to central pawns and bishop pawns. For central pawns, it doesn't really matter if the king is cut off on the long or short side of the pawn, and I will be covering this in a later video. Now obviously for a bishop pawn, it is impossible to cut off the king on the short side of the pawn due to the insufficient files. And knight pawns are the exception. In order to win with a knight pawn on the fourth rank, it will require at least three files of separation. And I will also get into this in a later video. And for rook pawns, it's usually a draw if one manages to exchange off the rooks and bring his king towards the corner that the pawn is heading towards. So the first realistic try is to go pawn to e5, hoping for a mistake in rook to e8, which allows king e4 transposing to the winning position with a pawn on the fifth rank and the black king being cut off by a file. But after e5, black doesn't have to play rook e8, he can instead play the rook to a4, which is the best move, simply cutting off the white king. And if a move like rook to h1, which abandons the d file, then black goes king d7 or king d5, and eventually get his king in front of the pawn. Now if white tries rook d6 check, after king c7, white doesn't have a good follow-up because e6 is met with simply king takes rook. So white can also try to move rook to d4, but here simply captures. And after king d7, king d5 is a draw since white cannot get his king in front of the pawn. And if instead of rook, takes, uh, rook to d4, White can also try to move e6, threatening to promote with e7, and if rook to a8, then white goes rook to d8. But here black goes king c7, which stops white's threats. If rook d7 check, king c8, and here king d8 is sufficient. So if the move e7, instead of rook d7 check, then black simply retreats the rook to a8, followed by rook to e8, and this should be sufficient to draw. So going back to the variation with rook d7 check. So here, instead of rook h7, white can try to move king to d3. And on king d3, rook a6 should be sufficient, simply hitting that pawn with no decent defense for black. So if the rook comes over to e7, then the king steps to d8. And e7 is impossible because of king takes d7. So another try is rook to d6. And here after king c7, white will play the move e7. So taking will be a mistake because this allows white to promote. But here simply rook to a8 followed by rook to e8, and black is fine. So we now have a rough idea of how black can try to defend 1e5. Now let's take a look at the second way which white can try to advance his pawn, which is king to f4. Luckily for black, he has sufficient checking distance with the pawn being on the 4th rank. So here rook f8 check king g5, Rook to e8, this is an important uh, move to remember, pressuring this pawn. So here rook g8 check would be a mistake because king f6, and after rook f8 check, king e7, followed by pushing the pawn, white has won a tempo by attacking the rook. So no better is rook to e8, simply e5, and note that on rook h8, with the idea of checking on the sides, this doesn't work because there is insufficient checking distance as white's king is on the short side of the pawn. So rook to e8, very important move to remember. 
king f5, rook f8 check, king g6, and here not rook to g8, as we have already discussed, but rook to e8. So rook d4 is white's last try to win. Rook to e1 allows the king to step towards the pawn. So rook to d4. So white is basically hoping for a mistake, like king c7, which allows white the tempo gaining move, king f7. And after rook e5, king f6, rook e8, e5, and white will win the game. So on rook to d4, a very important re resource to remember is king to c5, attacking the rook and putting it in an awkward spot because the rook is also defending the e4 pawn. If rook a4, then king d6 should be sufficient for a draw. So if a rook d5 check, king c6, and once again white is stuck with this problem of the hanging pawn on e4 and pushing is impossible because of king takes rook king f5 so this part becomes rather tricky rook f8 check and here white has two ways of uh, pressing on let's take a look at the first which is king g4 with the idea of intercepting with the rook so after rook f8 check white's idea is to play rook f5 here black goes rook to a8. With this move, black is gearing up for an important defensive maneuver. So rook f7, another try is to go e5. But here king d7 brings, uh, brings black closer to the Philidor position. So king f, uh, rook to f7, white is basically preparing to advance his king, being shielded by the pawn. King d6, getting closer to the pawn, king f5. So if e5 check, then king e6. And black is going to hold this position without much difficulties. So going back to king f5. Rook a5 check. King f4 would allow king e6. So king f6. And here a crucial move, rook to e5. And all of a sudden, you can see that this pawn on e4, uh, e4 can't be defended. White can try rook d7 check, but after king takes d7, king takes e5. King to e7, and black draws with the opposition. So let's go back. The other try is king to e5. And here rook e8 check. King d4 now black has a few methods of drawing this position. So rook a8 is one of them, just trying to check on the long side of the board. So I believe you should be uh, pretty familiar with this idea of checking on the long side. So we will only take a look at the other try, which is rook e7. And here the basic idea is to play rook d7 and exchange of the rooks. Now obviously white has other methods of trying to confuse black in this position. But it would be too time consuming to go through every single line. But basically black should be fine if he follows the basic principles in the Philidor position and the Philidor position gone wrong. So we will only be looking at e5, rook d7, which forces a trade. The trade ends favorably for black because after king takes d7, king d5, Black is controlling the squares in front of the pawn, so the game is drawn. I'll play through till the end. So we have seen what happens with uh, in the starting position with the king being on c6. What happens if the king is on c7? So with the king on c7 and black to move, the game would be a draw. Black draws with king c6, which transposes back to our previous position, or the much simpler rook to d8. So if white moves the rook away from the d file, then simply king d7, and black will attempt to get his king in front of the pawn. So if uh, rook takes d8, king takes d8, king d4, 
So here king to e8, the only move which draws the game as black is just preparing to take the opposition as soon as white steps up the board. So if king d5, then king d7 and the game is drawn. So what happens if it's white to move? So white to move would win due to the fact that black cannot utilize this defensive resource of king c5 to chase away this rook on d4. Let's have a quick look. So king f4, rook f8 check. King f5, rook f8 check, king g6. Rook to e8, rook to d4, and here king c5 is impossible. If king c6, simply king f7. King f6, rook e8, and e5 wins. With the pawn on the fifth rank, one file of separation is sufficient to win the game. So let's go back a few moves. So here king c5 would lose the game after rook d5 check, followed by picking up the rook. So that is all for this video. I know it's quite complicated and I'm probably missing out on some lines, but I hope after watching this video, it would give you a general idea of how to defend this position. So hopefully you found this helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.